Thanks for joining Doug C. and me to review some of the early developments of Judge McMillan's amazing legacy for justice in Charlotte and the state of North Carolina. We're going to describe to you six of the most strategically important decisions affecting the rights and needs of low-income people in our community. We hope to summarize the uh, holdings in these cases and to show you why many of the decisions that were made are still relevant today. I'm going to discuss three important conditions that were affecting low-income people in 1974 and then describe what happened in the three cases the judge decided to address these conditions. Although the legal framework of the three underlying problems are different, they all converge on making the lives of people very difficult and miserable and hard to hold on to their homes. And in that way, they're all connected. The first of the major problems had to do with the urban renewal program. The city of Charlotte had already gotten federal funds to demolish the neighborhood called Brooklyn in the downtown area. And then as of 1970, the city had a new grant to do more urban renewal of two other neighborhoods known as Greenville and First Ward. In 1970, Congress had passed the Uniform Relocation Act, which required cities using urban renewal to provide suitable, affordable relocation housing that was fit and habitable. The residents that were faced with the urban renewal projects in First Ward and Greenville, however, had seen what happened in Brooklyn, they were skeptical. They came to the legal aid office in 1970 and said, we don't want this to happen to us. The legal aid folks and a couple of pro bono lawyers filed a suit to enjoin the urban renewal program in uh, First Ward and Greenville. And in the case of Harris versus HUD and the city of Charlotte, um, the judge entered a temporary restraining order, which then precipitated a negotiated consent judgment that was finally signed in 1973. The problem in 1974 was that the lawyers in the legal aid office had left and uh, there was nobody monitoring the judgment. So tenants in the first war neighborhood started showing up in 1974 saying, we're being forced out into housing that's either unfit for habitation or unaffordable for us. Something needs to be done. A related problem for people in housing difficulty had to do with the way the Social Services Department was deciding uh, applications for financial assistance under the AFDC program. When people lose their income and they have children, they had the right uh, to come and get financial assistance in order to survive. The problem in 1974 was that many people that were applying were not getting decisions in a timely way. The federal law required decisions to be made in 45 days, but tenants were coming to the Office of Legal Aid and saying they had applied 60, 80, 90 days ago and never gotten a decision. They were then faced with terminations of all their utilities, eviction notices, and eviction complaints. They were on the edge of disaster. The Social Services Department told us that they were having personnel problems. They just didn't know what to do when some of their, their eligibility workers were out on maternity leave or they quit, and they, therefore they were just not able to handle the applications. This was a very significant problem that was affecting numbers of people. Another major problem which had been persisting 
for many years was the legal framework for landlord-tenant law. For over 200 years, tenants had had no rights to repairs and landlords basically didn't feel any responsibility to provide heating equipment, safe wiring, structural integrity, or anything. Therefore, there was a, a whole lot of people that were living in unsafe and unsanitary conditions. The only remedy tenants theoretically had was to call a housing inspector. But it was a common practice for landlords to retaliate against tenants that did call housing inspectors by evicting them, and there was no state law to protect against those retaliatory evictions. The other problem was the state eviction laws. When landlords filed eviction complaints, they all went to the small claims court that was governed by magistrates. The magistrates were not judges, they were not trained in the law, and they didn't display any interest in uh, learning the law or applying whatever law there was to the facts. So in most instances, the magistrates would virtually automatically enter judgments against tenants, and the tenants then had a theoretical right to appeal for a trial in district court where they could have a jury. But there were statutory impediments that made that right worthless. The tenants had to put up a, a bond in the amount of three months rent immediately following the judgment or, uh, or they would be evicted before they had their new trial. And because the evictions were carried out in a way that decimated their families, it was a worthless right. Uh, people had their possessions put out on the street and vandals could go through them and take whatever they wanted. So losing in small claims court was the end of the road for people legally at that time. Here's what uh, the decisions made by Judge McMillan did to address these three problems. In the uh, federal case against the urban renewal program, Harris versus HUD, the judge found that uh, it was necessary to to fix two problems. One was having a review of the individual cases to make sure that people actually got an affordable place that was in fit and habitable condition. The judge appointed one of his former law clerks, attorney Fred Hicks, to monitor every single displacement under the urban renewal program. And in addition to that, there was the need to have enough affordable housing for people to go. And under a con another consent judgment that was negotiated uh, through the, the power of the court, the city had to build seven new apartment complexes, one of, one of which uh, you see depicted here <coughs> in the slide. Uh, it's still in operation. In order to have suitable uh, uh, relocation housing for people, those seven complexes are still in operation today and help provide the inventory of affordable housing in Charlotte. <clears throat> the problem with the eviction rules was uh, addressed in the case of Usher versus Waters Insurance and Realty Company. Debbie Usher was a, a white woman who rented her home in a mixed neighborhood uh, and uh, she made a, a mistake of allowing black friends to come and visit her there, which offended some of her white neighbors, who then complained to her landlord. The landlord's response was to evict her and gave no reason in the complaint. When we went to court and tried to raise her defenses under the Federal Fair Housing Act, the magistrate was uninterested in it she lost immediately and then was faced with what to do on the appeal. 
she appealed. She could pay one month's rent, but she couldn't pay the three months rent required by the, the statute, and therefore she was subject to being evicted immediately. We filed a complaint in the federal district court that was assigned to Judge McMillan, and in the uh, ultimate review of the statutes, the judge uh, found that all three of them were unconstitutional under the 14th Amendment by denying equal protection of the law and due process to low-income tenants. Uh, and this ruling completely changed the environment for landlord-tenant law throughout the state of North Carolina. It enabled tenants for the first time in history to have access to trial judges that could decide the uh, rights of tenants many of which were later uh, developed by amendments to the statutes by the General Assembly, the rights to have repairs, the rights of protection against retaliatory eviction, and other essential rights. Another um, very important uh, case that addressed the problems at the Social Services Office was Alexander versus Hill. We filed this case in August of 1974 on behalf of some of the families that had gotten no decision and were facing eviction and termination of all their utilities. Uh, as a result, uh, we negotiated with the State Department of Social Services and uh, a, an order was entered to require them to make all the decisions timely within the 45 days required by law. And we monitored that, that decision, that uh, consent judgment for six years. The county departments never were able to perform well enough and the judge lost his patience and finally entered uh, a subsequent order that required the departments of social services to pay a sanction of $50 per week for every week that the decision was overdue. The state appealed that to the Fourth Circuit and lost, and then the state petitioned the United States Supreme Court for dis discretionary review, which was denied. When the judgment was then final in 1984, uh, the departments of social services started to improve their performances gradually. In the meantime, they were paying out millions of extra dollars to the clients uh, as a result of the judge's order. You'll, you'll hear more about the second phase of this decision from Doug C. You're also going to hear what the practical strategic value of the Usher case was from Carol Hardison, the Director of Crisis Assistance Ministry. Hi, I'm Carol Hardison, and 22 years ago, I became the second CEO of Charlotte's Crisis Assistance Ministry. Founded in 1975 due to an explosion of homelessness, this is a one-stop shop for people facing housing insecurity. Over 100 families a day seek emergency financial assistance to prevent eviction and utility disconnection, and this was before the pandemic. Had it not been for the 1977 decision by Judge McMillan in the Waters case, two incredible financial impediments would be existing today that are no longer with us. One, a family used to have to come up with three months rent for rent bond. And I'll tell you, my 22 years, I've never seen a family with three months rent in their back pocket. Secondly, the funds were required immediately Today, there's a 10-day window for a family to seek the ability to pull together a package of aid to stay stably in their home. They come to Crisis Assistance Ministry, and they have some funds. They often have one or two, three hundred dollars. They just don't have it all. And so together, we're able to create that stability and help them move financially towards a place of security and safety. We're incredibly appreciative of the work of Judge McMillan 
And today I know that the 3,000 people that are homeless in our community would probably be two or three, maybe four times that amount, had it not been for this moment. I'm Doug C. I'm an attorney with Charlotte Center for Legal Advocacy, formerly Legal Services of Southern Piedmont. Um, and I am really pleased to be here with my longtime friend and mentor, Ted Follett, uh, to talk about uh, the importance of Judge McMillan to, to social justice for low-income people and people, other needy pe folks, especially the disabled. Um, I want to start with the Alexander case, which Ted told you the part one of. Part two was sort of where I came in in the early 80s when I came to Charlotte. Um, the case essentially grew not to be just about timely processing anymore, but of stopping the state from circumventing the, the rights of applicants in other ways, by discouraging them from filing applications, by saying the office is closed, so you'll have to come back another day, or we don't have time to see you today, or by saying you have to provide us 75 pieces of irrelevant information before we will process your application and we're not gonna help you get any of that information. And uh, that furthermore, you didn't say the magic words, so we're not gonna consider, consider you under all the Medicaid eligibility categories. And by this time, the case was more about Medicaid than cash assistance. It had always protected the rights of both Medicaid applicants and cash assistance applicants. But eventually, Congress repealed the AFDC statute. But for Medicaid, the case still has enormous consequence today in terms of protecting people's due process rights throughout the application process. And it also became a national model, starting with what Ted talked about, the remedial fines, but moving on to all the other uh, remedial orders that were that were granted over time in terms of bringing about compliance from a recalcitrant government agency. Um, and when the case was finally dismissed in 2001, almost 27 years after it had been filed, um, the, its protections were continued even after then in state regulations, and many of them ended up in federal regulations. So this case still matters a huge amount today. And to understand why it still matters today, I want you to hear a story from a recent Medicaid applicant. Last year, I was diagnosed with stage three breast cancer. At 28 years old, I was unprepared, I was uninsured, and the first thing my doctor asked me was how I planned on paying for all of my treatment, which is very shocking and very concerning. Before I started chemotherapy, I did have to purchase my prescriptions out of pocket, which the cost alone was over $200. Luckily, at my job, we provide our patients with prescription discount cards, which I was able to use and save a little bit of money there. However, it wasn't enough, and I had already applied for Medicaid and got denied. So I started doing some more research, and I found that Medicaid has a breast and cervical cancer program, which I was hoping to qualify for. So I printed out the application myself, and I faxed it into the local social services department. In about two weeks, a caseworker contacted me and she was curious as to how I got the application and I explained it to her. She let me know that somebody in the hospital was supposed to refer me to the program and that the application had to be filled out in person. So she set up an appointment. I went in and filled out the application a second time. This time I had help from the Charlotte Center for Legal Advocacy Group who kept in touch with her. She told us that social services had 45 days to process the application. Well, it was well into three months and still no word from them. It was very stressful and very frustrating that it was taking so long because my bills were still piling on. I wasn't working as much and it was hard trying to keep a happy face for my nine-year-old son who was worried about me. Um, I was frustrated also that nobody at the hospital pointed me in the right way um, and gave me an idea that there was help out there for me, for somebody in my situation with no insurance. Luckily, in the end, Medicaid did approve me after all that time. It took them three months. Um, 
but they did approve me and it was like a weight had been lifted off my shoulders. Um, they did do retroactive coverage, so they helped me with practically all my bills and it was just one less thing I had to worry about. Um, I didn't have to worry about my bills and just focus on my treatment, getting better and of course taking care of my son. Um, I'm hoping that somebody else in my situation doesn't have to go through what I went through and it shouldn't take that long. Um, through my research, I did discover, however, that they started including the breast reconstruction surgeries um, October 2020. So I had my double mastectomy back in March already and Medicaid has been there every step of the way and I'm just grateful. Um, I'm on the right road to getting better with the help that they're providing and I'm just very glad. Wasn't that powerful? It really conveys this woman who desperately needed Medicaid to, to, to treat her breast cancer. She faced many of the barriers that, that the, the Alexander case was all about, even today. And it was because of the legal protections that survive Alexander that we were able to get her, her Medicaid and get her, her the uh, help that she needed. So the next case I want to talk about is the Hyatt versus Heckler case. This case started when in 1981, the Social Security Administration decided to begin massive terminations of people's disability benefits and denials of disability claims that had pre previously been unheard of. And in doing so, they were ignoring controlling decisions of the Fourth Circuit, claiming that they could non-acquiesce, that because they were a national agency, they were immune to what the court and the Fourth Circuit said the law was. And this caused tens of thousands of disabled persons in North Carolina to suffer hugely because this was their only source of income. And of course, they were not working because they were disabled. So a class action lawsuit was filed by Legal Service of Southern Piedmont with a critical help from Robinson Bradshaw and Henson, which put in countless hours uh, on a pro bono basis in this case. Uh, and that was filed in 1983, challenging this practice. And this case went on for many years, as did, as Alexander had, because again, we had an agency that continued to be recalcitrant and did not, and to appeal everything. The case actually went to the Fourth Circuit, I believe, four different times. It went up to the Supreme Court at least once, and the Supreme Court had to send the case back to, because the Fourth Circuit had unfairly limited Judge McMillan's relief in this case. Um, in a way that was not consistent with the law and which didn't recognize the reality of, of what was happening. So because of these multiple levels of appeal and because of the continued uh, violations of the law by the agency, there were actually at least three different rounds of litigation in this case, three different times that relief was provided to a growing class of, of persons. Um, by the time in the 1990s got here, um, the, the, by the time we settled the case and in 1994, there were 140,000 persons in North Carolina who had to be notified of their right to relief just under the Hyatt Three de decision. And, and 78,000, a huge percentage of them, did request that relief. Um, Judge McMullen even had to strike, to expand the class membership by 49,000 people later after Judge McMillan died. So this case ended up having an enormous impact, not just because hundreds of millions of dollars in disability benefits were paid to disabled North Carolinians, but because Social Security ended up adopting a national policy, mostly abolishing this non-acquiescence and recognizing that they did have to follow the law as interpreted by the courts. And this, of course, continues to be cited as a fundamental preservation of that constitutional separation of powers that is ultimately to the courts to decide what the law is. Now, the next case I want to discuss is Carter versus Morrow. 
This case had to be filed by legal services in the early 80s because in North Carolina, the child, North Carolina State Child Support Enforcement Agency only provided its services to the small percentage of poor children who were getting, at that moment, AFDC benefits. Remember that cash welfare program. And of course, the reason the state did that is because all of the child support it collected in those cases, it kept for itself to repay itself for those AFDC payments, as limited as they were. The result was that poor children who were not getting AFDC at the time lost millions of dollars in unpaid child support from absent parents in violation of federal law. So Legal Service Southern Piedmont filed this case in 1980 preliminary injunction was entered by the judge requiring the state to provide these services to all families who needed them. They could charge money to, to higher income families, but of course, uh, the, the families that we cared about, low-income families, could not afford private attorneys to go to court and represent them against uh, deadbeat dads. So this, having a state agency that they could go to that ended up only charging them $20 to, 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 to provide these services turned out to be of enormous importance. And today, $700 million every year in child support is collected by this agency and paid almost all of it to the low-income families. Now, the Thomas S. case, we've lost our slide. Here it is. The Thomas S. case was filed by Woody Kinnett and other lawyers at Legal Services of Southern Piedmont in the, in the 80s because of unnecessary and really inhumane institutionalization of people with developmental disabilities and mental illness. This was very expensive to the state. Uh, the, the, the doctors knew that it did, it did nothing more than warehouse these folks, that they needed their families and to be in the community in order to get better and in order to, to have a meaningful life. But it, there was no real, uh, not enough impetus to change the system until this case was filed. And it, it basically uh, represented an 18-year-old named Thomas S. with both mental retardation and schizophrenia who had been housed against his will in the Broughton State Hospital. Judge McMillan granted a summary judgment to him, finding that the state had a constitutional duty to, under the 14th Amendment to assure that they did not restrain his freedom any, in any more restrictive a manner than was necessary for his treatment. The Fourth Circuit affirmed the U.S. Supreme Court declined to hear the state's appeal. So these were, this was a critical precursor for what became later of the case, by the way, was expanded to a class action in 1988. And again, the Fourth Circuit affirmed that again, the Supreme Court declined to hear the appeal. And, and b this became sort of the impetus for what later became the Americans with Disabilities Act and the Supreme Court's Olmstead decision, which, which basically have to do with the right to receive treatment in the least restrictive environment possible. And that movement toward deinstitutionalization, that national movement, has taken root and is continuing today. And it all really started with the Thomas S. decision. So these decisions made an enormous difference not in the North, not just in North Carolina, but nationally. And it is because of Judge McMillan that history was changed for low income people, for disabled people, and that agencies were told and, and, and that, and courts were told that you have to protect their basic human rights. And this is something that Ted and I are very proud to have been a part of. And we are ready for any questions that you want to ask us.